take your bulletins, we'll go through them, we'll go through it. But before we do so, uh, let us uh, begin with a word of prayer, please. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this wonderful day. Thank you that we, uh, we are your sons and daughters. We can present ourselves before the throne of grace to obtain grace and mercy uh, in this world of increasing darkness. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that your word is, is the light unto our path. It is the only light that we have in this world. Thank you for all the blessed promises that we have in your word. Thank you for the encouragement and, and uh, the support and uh, the hope that it gives us. Above all, thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, and the salvation. And all these things we, uh, we pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we have any new guests today? Anybody visiting us for the first time? Yes, no? All right. Uh, turn to your bulletins, please, to the uh, announcement section. This week in fellowship, uh, the Bible study, as always, on Wednesday nights, I encourage you all to uh, uh, attend by Zoom. Uh, the Bible study will be given once again by Pastor Sylvester Herbert. Uh, this week it will be at 7 o'clock, but on November 8th, the following week, it will be at 6 p.m. due to the time change, all, all right? So uh, note this in your agenda that this week it's at 7, but the following week it will be at 6 p.m. For the announcements... There's a number of announcements. The first is a reminder that there's always a prayer group after the Sunday service uh, uh, spearheaded by, by Warren Nagisal. So at Keter Hall afterwards, please join them if you can for the prayer group. Uh, please remember the Shamiri Baptist Food Bank that uh, we have. Everything is, is well organized now. We know that there's people in charge of them. So once in a while, uh, if you can bring something, some, some non-perishable item, or if it's, uh, there was clothes uh, at one point, or anything that you think that you have that is in very good condition, that you think would, would be beneficial for a family in need, please bring it to the church, and we will uh, provide this first and foremost for our own members who need it, and then uh, for the members of the community who, who may need so. So please keep this in mind. Uh, a reminder, September, Saturday, November 4th, Pastor LaRue is continuing his Bible study, his uh, theology studies uh, at 10 o'clock. And the topic this, uh, this coming Saturday will be on the angels, uh, which is uh, very interesting, not only because we have, uh, we have the good angels, but we have the evil angels, uh, and the battlefield is planet Earth, uh, and the angels are, uh, are there to are servants, either servants of God or servants of the devil. And the angels themselves uh, are not simply, uh, we have to remind ourselves that the angels are not simply uh, robots who, who obey orders. They have a free will of their own. Uh, and this is seen in details in scriptures occasionally. Uh, so they're there to be uh, for us, to, to, they work with us in our walk, in our Christian walk. So uh, it is a very interesting topic. Uh, so by all means, for those of you who can attend, please attend so. December 16th, we will have a, a small Chris, uh, Christmas concert. Um, if you have any ideas, any suggestions or whatnot, please see Nicole for this. She's the one who's in charge. 
I know that she'll be singing a beautiful song. We can't wait to hear that. Uh, a cappella, I'll talk to that. No instruments, just, she's gonna let it go. So please see Nicole if you have any ideas, or, if, or by all means, if you wanna participate, if you have an idea, go see Nicole uh, before December 15th, preferably. Also, the uh, second last note, the phone book. The new phone book is coming out in the month of January. So the current phone book is outside on, on a little lecture and the notes are there. Please take 30 seconds, go see the phone book. If your name, if all the contact information is correct, uh, home address, phone number, email, whatnot, then make a check mark. Say it's okay, it's fine, whatnot. Uh, because the new one is coming out in January, so now is the time to make any and whatever corrections you feel necessary. If you don't want to put uh, your, your uh, private information, like phone number or, 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 um, or home address, that, that, that's fine. But at the very least, if you can put an email where we can contact you, that would be uh, uh, greatly beneficial because sometimes when something happens, George fires out an email to, to all the deacons and to as many church members as uh, he has access to, to give you an update of whether there's uh, cancellation because of, of you know winter storm or whatnot. So at the very least, provide an email address. Uh, you can just create your own. You don't have to have, even if you don't want to put your personal email, create uh, your another email address only for the church. And this way you'll get information uh, via email. Uh, also, yesterday we had a wonderful service for, for Brother David. Uh, it, it, it was nice to see that many people here and we hear the testimony to see how he impacted so many people's lives. And as always, it's always sad when you lose a member of the church. Uh, it, it's just a normal reaction when someone passes away that there's, there's sadness and there's tears. Uh, but we can't forget that he's in heaven now. There's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. It's just an eternity of joy, of peace, of happiness, of 200% uh, of, uh, faithfulness, no more sinful body. So uh, we have this hope, like the Apostle Paul says, we shouldn't weep like the world that has no hope, but we have this glorious hope uh, in our hearts. So. Uh, we will continue to keep uh, Elena and, and uh, the family in prayer. We must not also forget uh, those that are here that are going through a hard time uh, with physical ailments and whatnot. Uh, I got a call this morning that Debbie uh, had to go to the hospital uh, in emergency, uh, but now she's doing better. Uh, so uh, please keep uh, Debbie in, in your prayers and as well as for Charles West to, is to handle all of this situation. And that's it, did I forget anything? Is there anything, any special announcements? No? All right, so for the congregational praise, we have our own two angels, Teresa and Charlene, who will lead the congregational praise.
want to find it, but please stand if you're able and let's uh, lift the name of the Lord on high. Amen? Amen. Let's lift, lift the name of the Lord on high. Amen? Amen. 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 Yes. Oh, 
and he has gained his crown from the Lord. And I know, and I know that he heard those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And he's now in the presence of our Savior. Can we sing that, that last, the chorus? Can we sing it a cappella? And just think that this could be a reality if it isn't yet. All it takes is the free gift of salvation. And if you're not sure how to go about doing that, please seek somebody. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. And we never know. I know that there was an actor, I believe, who drowned yesterday, Matthew Perry. Matthew Perry, sudden, he drowned. I mean, anything. God knows when we're taking our last breath. So if you haven't made that decision today, seek the Lord. Reach out to someone who can pray for you that salvation and so much prayer. So let's sing that with chorus. Akala, O oh, victory in Jesus. Oh, victory!
was. Yeah, I was waiting for another one. I was waiting for another. Just hearing that and just hearing all of the places of what it's going to be when we are in the presence of the Lord. Just, it's, it's just beautiful. And hearing all the voices, I was hearing Harmony's voice. She's our future. The children are our future. And I'm not trying to, I'm not talking about the secular song, We Are the World. Um, the children are our future. And continue seeking God, following Him. You, your sister, your brothers. God will never steer you wrong. And you know I have a special, you have a special place in my heart. And I will always be there for you. You know Auntie Charlene loves you and I will be there for you. And I will be always willing to pray for you. Okay? You and your sisters and your brother. All right. We love you. We love you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the church and where we meet. And we're missing Debbie and we're missing many others that are not here today. But uh, everybody's welcome. And everybody here is part of a family, family of God. So welcome. And uh, uh, the scripture reading today is in John 12 starting in verses 44 to 50. Um, here, um, they were talking about the people who believe in Jesus, but were afraid because of the religious people to say and to uh, just publicly uh, proclaim that they believe in Jesus. So Jesus knew this was going on in their hearts, and this is what he said. Then Jesus cried out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me shall stay in darkness. As for the person who hears my words but not, does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that this command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. He just brought light into this darkness, and uh, we see so much darkness around us these days that we need his light. <coughs> so may the Lord add his blessing upon his word. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I would like to ask now for Brother William, sorry, uh, if you can come up and do the family prayer, please. And also, I'd like to invite the junior church, uh, if you'd like to prepare uh, to, for their, their study with me. So. Good to see you all here this morning. Let's 
lecture them, throw some of them, which would be under the prayer of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, we bring those little children before you. Father, as they are preparing themselves now to go to the cater hall for their lesson, we ask you to go with them, encourage their hearts, and guide them, and help them, Father, to be with their teacher, help them to be silent and keep the peace you want them to have and listen attentively to their teacher. So we pray for the teacher as well as she teaches them. That will give her the patience she need to deal with that. So Father, we ask you to bless these children and help them, Father, to always encourage to come back into the house of the Lord again, to worship you, to honor you, and know more and more about you. Help them to encourage their friends, their neighbors, their family to come and come again. So Father, be with them now as they go and let your spirit be guiding them and leading them and help them to listen attentively to their teacher. And when they leave today, they will live with great joy in their heart and have that urge to come back again. We thank you, Father, for what you want to do for them now and always. In Jesus' mighty name. Comfort her hearts and be with her. 
help her, Lord, and not to stumble or fall as she live alone. We pray that you will guide her, protect her, and give her safety in that house. Remember many others who live alone, Lord, we bring them before you. Remember Marjorie and Owen, Peter, Owen, Lord, we pray for them, Lord, that you will touch them in a special way and help them to rise and stand again and be strong as they ever used to be before. Remember Dwyer Grant, oh Father, be with them all. Remember our sister, Cynthia Lennox, Father, live alone. We pray for guidance and protection of Amber. Remember uh, our sister, uh, Blossom Henry as well, Lord, and many more, Madam Adele Ince, Dermot Allen, oh, Father, it is so many. So even those that they named in mention, I pray that you will continue. Hold them up, encourage their hearts, and help them, Father, to be safe in their dwelling. Ruth Grant as well, Father, live alone. And we just pray for each and every one, even the entire congregation. Sometimes we live with family, friends, and neighbors, but we can still run into difficulties. So we just pray for guidance for each and every one in here this morning. And those that have been able to make it, we pray for them as well. You know them by name, you know them by numbers. So we thank you for what you're going to do for each one. Remember the poor and needy this morning. We pray for them, Lord, that you will provide for them in a special way and help them to overcome their difficulty. Remember the widow, the infant, the fatherless, and the homeless, wherever they are, Pray that you will provide for them and help them to come out of the deep hole that they are in. Help them to rise up out of and be on top of that mountain again where they can see some beautiful cities around them. Oh Father, we thank you for what you want to do for each one. Oh Father, remember those people who are suffering under sinful men and in the Eastern world, Father. In, in, in Israel, in Ukraine, in Gaza, and all those places, Lord. We ask you to be there. Speak to the heart of those leaders, I pray, that you will speak to them, that they will surrender this war and drop their weapon and give these people another chance to live a normal life again. So we pray that you speak to them in your own way, Father, and help them to be guilty and submit this war to one another. Just leave it right there. So, Father, I just pray for what you want to do for each one. We pray for our country, Canada, Lord. We ask you to continue to lead our country and make this country a blessing as it's been doing. We ask you to keep the evil ones out, Lord, and just comfort their heart that they may not do anything foolish. But we pray that this country will continue to stay calm and quiet. United States, Canada, and all the rest of the world, we pray for peace and safety in this world. So we thank you for what you want to do for us, Father Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray for ministers and pastors who go out in the world to preach your gospel, wherever they are. We pray that you guide them, protect them, and give them safety. Keep the evil ones away from them. Keep all obstacles out their way, and have them to return back to their place of our own safety. We pray for our pastor that we are looking for in this church, Father God. We pray that soon and very soon you will present us with one to lead your church, to lead your people, and give them the wisdom they need, whoever he may be, to lead the church in the way you want it to go. So thank you for what you want to do for each and every one. We pray for each and every one in this church who step forward in the different ministry to do different things for the church. Oh, Father, we ask you to guide them, protect them, encourage their hearts that they continue to do what they do in good faith. So we thank you for your love, we thank you for your care, and we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We pray for the pastor this morning as he preaches, as whatsoever he teaches us today, Lord. We pray that you will give us understanding that we can continue to share with others when we leave here. And we just pray that you fill that pastor with the Holy Spirit, that he deliver your message with great joy. So, Father, we thank you again for today. We pray that you bless this service and make it be a blessing to each and everyone. 
We thank you now for whatever task we may approach throughout the rest of this day and all the days ahead. We pray that you make it be a great blessing to us and to others. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, William. All right, so without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Charles to uh, come and uh, share the word of God with us. Good morning, church. Good morning, family. Good morning, everyone on Zoom. Deborah and I, we, we prepare Bible studies that we do every day. And a couple of weeks ago, we, we were coming across the chapters of John 11 and 12. And we went through it, and for the first time, I am a student disciple of Christ, but I think for the first time I understood what Jesus was saying when he was portraying his relationship to his Father. A very important part of our being a Christian. Without that relationship we can be really truly lost. But the two characters that stand out and portray this relationship that are said in the books of John 11 and 12 are Martha and Mary. And so today's sermon, I would like to give you a slight synopsis of that time and those two characters, but their relationship to what Jesus said. And it is a gospel that occurs not only in John, but in Mark, and also Luke. There are further details about the anointing that Mary does of Jesus' head and feet. I don't know what the word would be. I don't, I wouldn't call it ironic. But yesterday when I was here and we attended the funeral of David O'Brien, two things stood out to me, both from the pastor, Ray LaRue, when he said that David was a helping hand in the church. But he also was a very faithful member I don't mean just in that sense that he attended church every week, but that Christ was in him. It was part of his life. It was part of how he breathed. It was part of who he was. And so his celebration yesterday was a celebration of both his service, his helping hand, and his worship. I was particularly moved by a lady that came into the church who we know, Ishtar and Antonio, who my wife and I have come to know as well. And I was particularly struck that when she was a refugee and coming here, the first and helping hand was David who really helped her through. And now she is a member of our community, a member of this church, part of our family. And she lives her life and breathes her life with two wonderful children and another child on the way. So it was a reminder yesterday when the scripture was spoken of from John 
that I am the resurrection and the life. That indeed, what was spoken of in his funeral was true for all of us. And it's the message, I believe, that Jesus gives to all of us. I am the resurrection and the life. But now, let me begin my sermon. And good morning again to those on Zoom. I always forget. <laughs> now, six days before the Passover festival, Jesus returned from Ephraim. Ephraim was about 35 miles north of Jerusalem and very close to the wilderness. But he returned to the town of Bethany, which was just two miles south of Jerusalem. Bethany, you see, was the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. This is the household that of two sisters and a brother. There's no mention of a father or a mother. It's two sisters and a brother. That was their household. But they had come to know Jesus over the years. Now, Jesus returned from the deep wilderness near the city of Ephraim. But this spoke to the jarring reality that the chief priest of the Sanhedrin council, his name was Caiaphas, and he was appointed by the Romans. Most people don't understand that. You see, Rome had had come in in 63 BC and completely and utterly devastated the area of Judah and Israel. They had the campaign and they won their war. And after there was a tremendous rebuilding under the three kings that were appointed that were looking after the land, but they gave the Jewish people, for they requested it and received under the authority of Pontius Pilate, the governor of the province that then was called Palestine. They gave him the authority, but they gave the Jews their right to continue their civil law and their religious laws to practice their religion. Now, the thing was that Jesus came into this mix and he was a man of miracles who the people were turning to and proclaiming this is the king of Israel. This is our deliverer. This is the one we've been looking for. But you see, to Caiaphas, Jesus was a threat. He was seen as an instigator, someone who would upset the treaty, if you like, between Rome and the head of the council, the head of the Sadducees and Pharisees. But the council was unable to match Jesus' gifts of new life, and they were opposed to God's life-giving purpose of a true light in a new world. So they coalesced the council to protect their authority and power and to plot against Christ. In the chapters 10, John 11, 
Caiaphas coldly calculated that it was better for this one instigator of Jesus and his miracle of the right and the raised life of Lazarus to die rather than a whole nation. You see, they didn't want to give away their powers of religious and civil laws, the very thing that kept them together as a society. But here now for the first time in chapters 11 and 12, in the characters of Martha and Mary, we have a crystallization. We have a crystallization of what worship is and what service is. You must remember that Jesus, when he returned from Bethany, he don't have no courage. But he was fulfilling his destiny. He knew. He said, I will walk in the light, not in darkness. He walked unafraid, and he came back to Bethany. But he was coming back to Bethany, which I'm reading from chapter, the beginning of chapter 12, because they were going to celebrate the raised life of Lazarus. But in John 11.57 states that what went out from the council was that anyone, anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that Jesus might be arrested. This is the reality that Jesus faced. Yet Jesus could not be kept from his destiny, his Father's fulfillment. So Jesus returned to Bethany. Well, a celebration in his honor and Lazarus' life was being held, prepared and serviced by Martha with the joyful and grateful Mary and Lazarus in attendance. But how do we measure that joy and gratefulness that Mary must have felt, and Martha as well? You see, in Scripture, in Luke 10, when this anointing of Jesus on the head and the feet, and you must remember that when a supper was done, they were in a reclining position. So it would be very easy to anoint the head and anoint the feet. It wasn't like he was sitting down at the table like we do today. So it was different. But in Luke 10.40, it's recorded that Martha was annoyed by her sister Mary and the anointing that she was doing of Jesus. Because she said, and I quote, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus' reply was, Martha, Martha, you are distracted by many things. There is need only of one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. No, Mary's self-giving love, and because I truly believe, like the disciple Thomas, she knew and understood, finally, who this was. She understood that this was Lord God. And she anointed and gave her unequivocal action her unrestrained gratitude and love. And that, my friends, is the very heart of worship. This was the gift of Mary, but the discipline, service, and honor given to Christ by Martha was her gift. 
without Martha's forethought in celebration of Christ's love and work, would there have been a location that would have allowed the fullness of her heart and love to be displayed? Or would this have only been a thanksgiving, but so inadequately shown? No, knowing of Christ's fullness of loving and giving, the light of light in Lazarus rising again, it was the least that Mary could do. But you see, I believe worship and service, they're two sides of the same coin. Two kinds of sides of the same coin of action. And the two sides are fully necessary for the full enactment of God's command of love and service, of worship and obedience. Meritorious works without faith are dead works. We must always remember, though, that the fullness of service, the helping hand, we must know that no matter how much we do for the body of Christ in his church, it must always be accepted that God's gift and God's love, his gift of salvation, far surpasses all that we can give. I can only pray and worship the almighty and righteous love and steadfastness of God who never fails. Yet, as much as Christ mildly admonished Martha, service without honor, discipline, dedication, and devotion leaves the church without the cement that binds the wholeness of the church in a structured community of love and action. Yet the aspect of service taken alone and the aspect of worship neglected, well, that the church becomes a dead body. It's merely the subscription of rights and duties performed without the spirit of love. And make no mistake as well, there's also the reverse. A church with worship and no structure can become a cult, a slavish devotion with no purpose beyond top. Without cohesion or practice of God's word, it becomes a church of show, but no substance. understand this in the context of 11 and 12. The verses I have read today is showing the very important relationship that Christ had with his Father. Think about this for a moment. He was Christ. He was the Almighty in human form, but fully divine. Fully divine. He could have done anything at any moment. Yet, let's examine what he did in the raising of Lazarus. Yesterday was just touched upon. And when he said, I am the resurrection and life, but what I want you to understand is the relationship he had with the Father when he did this. It's so powerful. It's so beautiful. Jesus and the day he raised Lazarus showed both his human and divine nature. But I might add in their proper humble relationship to the Almighty Father. 
You see, Jesus had waited two days more after he was told that Lazarus had fallen ill and asleep. His disciples had urged him to go, but Jesus chose to wait. Listen to what he said to his disciples in John 11, 11. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he found a household in mourning, where Jews from Jerusalem, as well as Bethany, who knew the family well, were in attendance. Both Martha first, and then Mary, later had met Jesus on that occasion when Lazarus was dead. And the first thing both Martha and Mary said was, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They understood. They understood that this was their man of miracles. But they had yet to understand who fully he was. In reply to Martha, Jesus said to her, when she said, if you had been here, my word would not have died, he said to her, your brother, will rise again. Now, it says in the scriptures very carefully, Martha understood that he would rise again in the parousia. That's the Greek word for the resurrection on the last day. But then Jesus said who he was. Not a prophet, not a great teacher, not just a man of miracles. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Martha's reply to Jesus' question for Jesus said to her, do you believe, Martha? Do you believe? And in John eleven twenty seven, 27, she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one come into the world. There are very few other times in the Bible this is done. Thomas, we know, professed in the end, Lord God. When Jesus first said to Thomas, now if Jesus had been a prophet and had died upon the cross and had never risen, he would have not known that he was stabbed in the side. The first thing he says to Thomas is, Thomas, come feel my side and my hands. Thomas comes to recognize that this man is Lord God. And I believe when Martha said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. She recognized who Jesus was.
So Jesus went to the tomb. He was Lord God incarnate. He was the Redeemer. He was Emmanuel. He was the light of the world. How easy it would have been for him to go stone roll away. But he never did. Because at that moment he had chosen to do that, he would have been a God we would never follow. We would have shrunk back and said, how can I be like that? How can I imitate that? How can I be righteous like that? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew, that's interesting because it's past tense, he knows, he knows because of who he was, fully human, fully divine. God incarnate among us, the God of mercy among us. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake, not just of his disciples this time, it actually says this, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that you may believe they have sent me, that you sent me. Then he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus had come out. My question for you today is, how do we believe today? You see, the Pharisees and Sadducees of the council would not believe in a Messiah, no matter what was shown them. Like the council, do we believe in the political and social and economic realities and ties to this world? That it is only these things that have the power to create or destroy? Or is this anything that shows that this is not true? That speaks of transcendent power and spirit, righteousness and love. This life that Jesus came and brought into this world, do we see it only as a threatening authority? Are we believers who need proof? Like doubting Thomas's. Who say, why did this Christ come into this world? 
and they await for miracles or what they can get. Or are we the logic supercritics that are exposed in John 11, 37? For there were many standing around that day, and they said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind, could not he have kept this man from dying? They put Christ on the same human level as themselves. In contrast, can we say we're like Martha and Mary? Faith with service and worship, with full adherence in the heart, that Jesus' death upon the cross, his perfect atonement for our sins, for he did no wrong, no sin. He is all outpouring love for you, for me, in body and blood, allows us to be reconciled back to the Father in the fullness of his love and mercy. As long as I submit and repent and give my will to Christ our Lord and not to my hell-bound ego and pride. Because it is easy today to be a pupil in the classroom of the great deceptive receiver, that roving prince of the air that strokes the ego and puffs out the pride. No, Jesus, in raising of Lazarus from the dead, was doing it with the timing and will of the Father, the One Almighty. Do you remember Jesus' talk to the young man who wanted to follow him? In Matthew 19, verse 17, he says, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. He was referring to the Father. People criticize God today on how he chose to save us from our sins. People say, well, he should have chosen this way, or they look for another way. They think we'll get them to heaven, but it won't work because we're not God. The Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus shows us by his relationship. The verses read to you today, 44 to 50, with his Father in heaven, that it is the Father's timing and decision that he follows. And we should follow through Christ and do the same and accept his divine providence in our lives. The question here today, I believe, is why do we want to know Jesus? Is it to be a super critic and defame and disarm him? Is it to get something from him or to believe in him as Mary and Martha and Lazarus did and be saved? Martha expressed her love for Christ in honorable service and love. Mary anointed the head and feet of Christ with precious nard, 300 denarii's worth, her own gift of a year's worth of labor. But it was criticized by Judas Iscariot, the one to betray Christ, who could only see his lack of material gain. So he hypocritically professed for the use of the poor that it could have been used. No, this gift freely given to Jesus was Mary's agape. Her love literally poured out on Jesus' head and feet, a foretelling of his crucifixion, death, and burial. 
but oh, how sweet, how sweet, how radiant. This nard often brought from the Himalayas, this radiant, penetrating, saturating aroma, the great saturating aroma of what Jesus proclaimed. I am the resurrection and the life. Martha and Mary both expressed their beliefs the way God made them. We too must be careful not to judge another person because we feel that our expression of God or love of God is the only way but we need to look for Jesus, I believe, for the right reasons. If you're looking for Jesus because you always want to be blessed with money and power, I'm sorry, you'll fall. If you look to Jesus when you want it, when you want healing and you want it now, remember, even Paul was not healed of his infirmity. If you look for Jesus for power, you'll fall. If you look to Jesus to prove God wrong, if you fall for someone who can always say that he was only a teacher, only a prophet, and he died and never rose again. I remember growing up in the generation when the book of Dan Brown the Da Vinci Code became a movie and it said, no, Jesus never really died. I remember being one of the people outside that cinema signing the petition saying, as great a movie this is, this is not the truth of Jesus Christ. The reason and only true reason we should be looking for Christ is what he has already done and given us his gift of salvation his word which is light so that you and I do not abide in darkness we are saved by his all atoning grace and mercy and forgiveness of sin in his body and blood that he shed on the cross of God. After this, everything is your relationship through prayer and dedication, service and worship. It is putting Christ in the center of your life, your love, your family, your work, your community. Not a once every Sunday peripheral action, no matter how faithful. It is bringing Christ to the center of your life. His love poured into you can be the love that is poured out in love and action, in service and in worship. It is putting Christ, as I said, at the center of your life. It is listening with his provided Holy Spirit when we repent and we are baptized. We are infused with his Holy Spirit so that we can do the will of our Heavenly Father and His will in time because of what Christ has done by His Word, His love, and sacrifice for us, with us, and through us, now and forever. Thank you, thank you for listening to this message today. I thank you for the prayers for Deborah as well. She's in the hospital, but she's been well attended. I went with the ambulance.
this one first and then I went right back to it in the car. You know, she's okay. She's in the best hands right now. But I felt it incumbent upon me to bring this message to them. Let me end with this prayer for all of us, for all of you, my family. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray. Oh, Jesus Christ, full Redeemer, I pray. Oh, Holy Living Spirit, I pray. Be with us all, evermore. As you abide, we abide. Walk and talk with us, evermore. For you are the resurrection and the life. Always. It just gives you sometimes a different perspective when you start hearing certain things being said in church when you said um, there, there's a familiar saying, your actions speak louder than words, right? What are our actions for Jesus Christ and to share his love with those we are in contact with? So if we could just all rise and sing our last song. I love you, Lord.